we only get rid of the problem uh, in the uh, in the bone marrow. So the Fanconi anemia is gone in the blood, but it's still in the rest of the body. That means that Fanconi patients also after a bone marrow transplant are still at the risk for developing cancer elsewhere, especially in the oral cavity. So that's very important to mention from the beginning on. We have heard a, a lot about these cancers now, and here are two examples, a very nasty cancer at the tongue and a very little one at the gingiva. So you hear uh, a lot of things, but I would like to uh, make some clear point and statement. Not every FA individual will develop squamous cell carcinoma. It is very important, and I really like that, that the awareness and the, the knowledge about these cancers has arisen in the past a lot, but still we do not need to be too much uh, frightened of these cancers. So it's like the hematological issue in Fanconi anemia not all Fanconi patients needed bone marrow transplant. Not all Fanconi patients suffer from low blood counts. And that's the same also with this squamous cell carcinoma. Not all FA patients uh, will get these cancers. But uh, compared to the average population, the risk, the pure risk to develop these cancers is much higher. So that's why we talk about these cancers. And of course, they are life-threatening and a life-threatening complication. So when I look back 20 years ago, when I began to work in the, the FA field, uh, most of the patients uh, had the problem and died due to hematological issues. Luckily, due to the more advanced bone marrow transplantations and the higher success rate, this is not anymore the case in our days. So more and more Fanconi patients reach adulthood which is really a very Im important um, progress over the last years. And uh, the Fanconi support groups have done enormous work on that. So that's really something to, to have in mind that we together can do something about life-threatening complications. And we haven't got still 20 years ago to just say all the patients will die due to hematological issues. So we worked against that. And I'm very hopeful for the future that we also can find our ways in terms of these cancers. So again, as said, these cancers are more a problem of the adult Fanconi patients. There are some few examples of younger Fanconi patients, but I would like to go into details uh, later on on that. So, and that is um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. David Cutler already mentioned that very extensively. Here you see a, a chart, and this is the ages of the Fanconi patients, and here's the cumulative incidence. And you see different, two different curves. This is the one, these are Fanconi patients who received a bone marrow transplant or a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And here are the ones who have not been transplanted. So you see the risk for developing cancer increases with age. And the ones with a bone marrow transplantation got these cancers a little bit earlier and the likelihood to get these cancers seems to be higher. In the past, there have been done many, many, many research on that. And the hope was that with the newer protocols, this difference uh, will be eliminated. So far, we have not been able to show that, but one of the major risk factors for the transplanted Fanconi patients was the appearance of GVHD. So this is something to have in mind when you go to, GV, uh, to bone marrow transplantation to take good care about GVHD. So we already heard that the squamous cell carcinoma are mostly located in the head and neck area. So this means the oral cavity, but it also can appear in the uh, pharynx and in the esophagus and also in the anogenital region. My talk will focus on the head and neck area, but we don't have to forget these other areas as well. David also showed that Fanconi patients uh, unlike the general population, seem to develop numerous squamous cell carcinoma and that local relapses so that the cancer comes back at the area where the cancer was, is a little bit more increased than in the general population. And that also secondary tumors, so again, more than two years after the first appearance of a cancer can occur, occur frequently. 
This doesn't mean that the treatment facilities and the treatment options are uh, uh, not good as in the first case, but of course a relapse is always not something to, to have uh, that we want to see very, very, uh, very likely. So uh, these cancers, sometimes when we have done already a large surgery, are a little bit more difficult to treat. And the treatment options, David already mentioned them very um, uh, nicely. The surgery is uh, the way to go, and that's why we need early detection, because then the surgery is small, because all other therapeutic uh, options are limited. There are new drugs approaching, like PDL1 inhibitors or targeted therapies, very promising, and already the first patients with very good and nice results. In the past, we have known that these Fanconi patients developing these tumors have a, had a poor prognosis and you see the timing after diagnosis, the ones to survive, seems to be a very, very bad prognosis. But this has been due to la late tumor stages and I would like to show you what late tumor stages means. Um, and uh, when you hear all this information, you can say, okay, uh, I don't want to listen anymore because it's already too much on my shoulders and the burden is too big. And we have this nice tradition at Camp Sunshine to have these wish boats. So we can make big wishes for the future, but we can also take action for the future. And this is what I very much like in the Fanconi field, also at Camp. It is not to be too much afraid because when you are too much of afraid you lose your option and you lose the time to to fight for yourself and i would like to show you this is a, a graph so when we talk about the higher risk in fa why do we have this higher risk and the answer is so far not easily to an to answer this question so we have some internal problems in FA. We have the genome in instability. We know DNA repair is not so, uh, in, so correctly done uh, like in, uh, in normal cells. We have problems with our immune system and many other issues that is typical for Fanconi patients. But this internal uh, system, we cannot or only very little influence, but we have a lot of things coming also from the outside, like, for example, carcinogens like tobacco or alcohol. We have nutrients that have an impact, especially on our epigenome. So we heard yesterday and on Friday a lot about what to eat. Uh, and that's very important because it has a huge impact uh, of uh, our cells. Also, David Cutler uh, spoke a lot about infections, for example, the HPV. Also, inflammation plays a huge role in the cancer development. So there are many things that you really can have in the hand. There is not all what you can control, but there are some things that you can control. And on these things, I would like to go into more detail. And this is what I mean to be proactive. This is a Fanconi patient, main, many of you know, and he had bone marrow transplant and cancer for several times, and he is doing very nicely, very well, has, uh, is married, and, uh, and he is very proactive fighting for himself, and that's why he's still alive, and I think this is the way we all have to go. So I would like to go uh, through four proactive steps against cancer with you. So the first thing is you need to have the information and the information needs to be a Fanconi based information. With general information from the general population, we can work a little bit, but we always have to find what is true from the general population for Fanconi. You know that you are special and that's why we have to focus on what is special information for Fanconi patients. Then we would like, I would like to so, show, show you something about the surveillance. That means how to take care of your oral cavity. We will talk about some don'ts and we will talk about the do-do's. Coming to the first point, information. I, as a German, I like soccer very much and I like this uh, picture because this is a goalkeeper which probably will, uh, who will probably not keep any of the ball because he is blinded. He's standing in the rain but he is blinded. So we need to get away this blindness, we, get, we need to have this information. 
So, and I just said that cancer and surviving correlates with age. And this is something what is true for the general population. And stage is means stage one, when the cancer is little, you can easily cut it out. Stage four is a, a, advantage, uh, a very advanced uh, cancer and there are um, already metastasis, so distant, uh, the, the cancer has spread. And these patients, even in the general population, they have a very low survival rate. And where is the information here for Fanconi patients? For the Fanconi population in the past, unfortunately, most of the patients have been diagnosed with stage four, so in these very bad stages. And this needs to be changed. So we can, when we focus on early detection, we can have good survival, survival and we have these um, examples also in our Fanconi community. And this is very much of to be improved that we move from this half of the patients to only little of the patients, so that most of the patients should be diagnosed in stage one. How can we achieve this? We have to know, and this is also something what you have seen from David Cutler, cancer does not arise from one day to the other. It has a history. It needs to develop. This is a drawing of the oral mucosa. Here you see this is inside of the body and this is the outside. And you see the oral mucosa, here's a basal membrane, is built up out of these cells sitting on this basal membrane. And sometimes changes in few cells can happen and can occur. And I must say this happens in all our body, in me, in everyone else, just by what we eat, what we have. So changes in the cells are very frequent. So how can they occur? You have, again, internal factors and external factors. Most of the internal factors in Fanconi anemia we cannot change. But the external factors we can have an impact on. So drinking and smoking, you saw the data, is not something to advocate to do as a Fanconi patient. Also, we know when we have a bad oral hygiene, this means chronic inflammation, then the immune system has a lot to do and sometimes they are so overwhelmed with fighting these uh, bacteria that they forget to clear off these cells. Also, lack of micronutrients like special vitamins um, can happen that the um, uh, immune system is not so much effectively working against those cells. And again, infections from the outside can also uh, bring problems like the polyoma viruses uh, or other viruses. So this is something to, to have an eye on. Because the good thing is that these changes can be reverted back to normal. But what happens if these changes are not reverted? Then these cells start to grow because they have a growth, growth advantage and then they already start to change. And under the microscope, this is something what we call dysplasia. And this is a mild dysplasia. Looking from the outside, mostly you already can see mild dysplasia. And here's a little example of a very little tiny lesion, one, milli, one to two millimeters of the size, very easy to miss. But sometimes also these lesions are bigger. And also the immune system is capable to get rid of all these cells. And there is already, again, this way back and forth. So even if you have something like that, you can cut it out or sometimes the things heal and then it's gone. So even if you see something, this doesn't mean that you are on the track to cancer, but mostly if these things disappear after three weeks, then you can be sure that the process is going backwards to normal. What happens if this doesn't happen? So if this is not healed and uh, cleared up by the immune system, then it goes along to moderate dysplasia, which ultimately leads to severe dysplasia. And here's an example of the very same lesion start to grow. So you see there is a grow, like the lesion is twice the size than here. You also see that the surface seems to be not so much of intact. You see also the surrounding tissue is changed 
So it is not so nicely looking like here. And you see something like a thicker wall around. This is called sclerosis. It's like when you have cut yourself, it's, uh, the tissue feels a little bit more thicker than normal. And um, mostly these steps are not revertible. So when you are here at the type for moderate or severe dysplasia, this is not cleared by the immune system. This needs to get out. Because what happens if this nut gets out, this will lead to carcinoma in situ, which is actually a real cancer, but the cancer that so far has not spread. You see the immune system will try to get rid of this area. And here's an example of a large lesion, which is a carcinoma in situ. And the carcinoma in situ, when you leave it like that, of course, will lead to an advanced cancer. So far, we don't know how much time it takes from here to there, but we know that this is not something that the progression is from one day to the other. These examples here, you see there is always in, uh, in that patient, there was one year in between, and that is a different patient uh, uh, waiting, uh, 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 saying that she had a lesion for more than two years until finally it ended up in a cancer like that. So the four, th four things, you have to know this information and what you can do now is the surveillance. So first of all, it's, uh, the surveillance is inspection and documentation. And I would like to advocate, uh, when you are a child, you, you are used to that the parents take over action. They, are, uh, they take care of you, they bring you to the appointments, they even uh, make the uh, inspection of your oral cavity, but there will come a time that you go out of the, uh, the, the home, that you uh, live your life by your own. And so this also belongs to taking care of yourself to start to do things by your own. So we talk now a little bit about inspection and documentation, and these things go together. The inspection per se is very easy, and I will show you later on. The documentation is most necessary because please don't trust your memory. We do forget what we have seen. And if you don't uh, document what you have seen, I, uh, then you will forget. And I recommend to use a mouth map, for example, something like that, so that you um, note, can note where the lesion was sitting, also probably the size of the lesion. And then you can document. We document with an endoscope system. Of course, this is nothing what everyone has, but uh, your physician can do that. Um, and uh, your physician also can take a sample, like we prefer the brushing, and uh, then the test can be done in the laboratory, and so you finally get the result. So below, these things are done by the physician. But you can do as a patient these three steps. You can do the inspection, you can do the documentation, and how can you do that? This is something what I would like to show you now. So the oral inspection, as I said, is not a difficult thing to do. It's like, for example, for the women, the breast examination. Most of the women do not do the breast examination because they are afraid of missing something. But not to do the breast examination is the worst what you can do. So uh, don't be afraid to miss something. It's better to look than not to do anything. And the uh, key of an, a good uh, inspection is that you have something like a routine, that you start at one point in your mouth, like for instance, at the outer side, and then you move to the uh, tongue and the cheek, and then uh, the upper, uh, upper tongue. Uh, and I will show you some of the examples later on in the next slides. So here you also see uh, pictures and you can download these examples uh, from, that, um, uh, from that site. And here are examples how to do that. First, you start to look at your lips. Then you look at the uh, um, labia mucosa, at the uh, upper area and then the lower area. You look at the cheek and also at the gingiva, at the left side, at the right side. And don't forget the gingiva in the back is very important. And then you start with the tongue um, and uh, uh, both sides, left and right side, below the tongue, 
be uh, the floor of the mouth and also the gingiva uh, um, that areas and also the heart palate here um, uh, also in the back and you can also have a look at the pharynx, uh, the, the oral pharynx like at the back here. Um, uh, David Cutler already mentioned, sometimes it's also important to use your finger. So uh, when you see something you can touch and you can feel the difference and there's enough tissue to compare, you have always left and right side, this is very nice in the oral cavity to have. The documentation should be done um, um, here in something like that. And uh, then you can uh, uh, follow the lesions because they should heal within three weeks. If they don't heal, go to a physician. I have here an example of cell phones and that's why, uh, why do I have that? The cell phones uh, are very nice to have because they have uh, light. So you can uh, try to uh, use that light when you uh, watch your mouth and then you can do self-examination like that. I know some Fanconi patients have uh, difficulties using their hand. So uh, I find it very useful to use also a spoon when you have nothing else and you can like that. It's more easy than when you have your fingers that are maybe too small. And with the cell phone, you can also take nicely pictures so that you can remember yourself how the pictures look like. Here's an internet uh, website where you can download an example and this information will be also available uh, later on at the Slack info, uh, site so that you can download uh, and you can uh, uh, write down the date when you have seen the lesion so that you don't miss uh, um, the timing. And why is this important? So when we have done our study with more than 700 Fanconi patients, we found out that the majority of Fanconi patients have lesions in their mouth that are just nothing. They are no, not malignant or even not pre-malignant. This have been 88% in our cohort. And you see here uh, a typical example. You see areas all over the mouth where you see here something there, something there. Oh, oh my goodness, what is that for our mouth? But it seems that this has somehow belongs to the disease and especially the older the patients are. So uh, don't be too nervous when you see a lesion, document, do a good uh, surveillance, uh, go for a checkup by your physician when the lesion doesn't disappear after three weeks and document with a cell phone picture and with a mouth map so that you recall where the lesion was sitting and when you have seen this lesion the first time. So I would like to show you some examples. What are the high risk lesions? Color is an incidence in our cohort. Uh, the white lesions uh, didn't progress to cancer, but there have been the red lesions and also the location where the lesions have been in the oral cavity uh, have been important. So we have seen um, uh, lesions at the gingiva um, most likely to be more aggressive. And this is because they, the, this tissue is closely attached to the bone uh, and the chances to develop metastasis in that area is um, much higher than at the tongue. So please take a good look at the gingiva. Of course, at the gingiva, you can have a lot of infections as well. So, but that's why your dentist has to do a good job to take good care of your gingiva. And also what we have talked about now very frequent is time since first appearance of a lesion. We have this time course where we see how cancer arises over a while. So it is very important to be aware of the time from first appearance until the lesion cleared or didn't clear. And again, also uh, the reaction on how the lesion reacts. When you touch it, when you brush your teeth and when you um, come uh, or when you just touch it with your finger and it starts easily to bleed, this is an alarming signal. Please go to your physician directly. And these are some examples. This is a uh, um, carcinoma in situ at the palate. Very easy to miss, diagnose as an infection. And here, this is also a lesion that you can easily miss at the back gingiva in the um, uh, upper, um, uh, upper uh, jaw. And here at the floor of the mouth, 
where when you touch this area uh, or when we touch that area, it was very strong, like if you would touch a stone, not what you feel normally in your in your oral cavity. So also you use the fingers when you uh, do the inspection. So we move again forward to the don'ts. I mean, like the don'ts are very easy. Don't drink too much alcohol. So this is more the German style, not so um, much uh, or highly recommend. So if you drink alcohol, think about the amount of alcohol, how much you drink and when you want to drink. So I would not say don't drink completely. We know that when you break down in your body, the alcohol, um, the first metabolite will be acetaldehyde which can cause uh, um, DNA damage. So you need to be aware of that. But um, so um, take care uh, uh, of the amount of alcohol you will, you will dr drink. Absolutely no go is tobacco smoke because um, uh, smoking has more than 3000 types of cancerogenic, cancerogenics inside. So with the alcohol, you have one cancer causing agent. And when you smoke, you have 3,000 components that are proven to cause cancer. So this is an absolutely uh, don't. And don't be afraid too much. Use the information that you have. Do the inspection, go to your checkups. So, and now we have the do's and the do's are very nice and very active to do. So an oral hygiene is something what you can treat and what, uh, what you can do very easily at home. And uh, there are very interesting studies that even if you use only the finger to brush your teeth, this is beneficial um, uh, or better than not brushing the teeth at all. Of course, in our days, we have toothbrush, we have toothpaste, and there are a lot of discussions, what is the best toothbrush and what is the best toothpaste? So I don't think that we really need a discussion like that. The most important discussion and decision is to use a toothbrush, to use a, use a toothpaste, and to do this regularly. Of course, a good oral mouth hygiene and the self-inspection every week, Every second week is a beneficial thing to catch lesions when they start to arise. A regular screen by an expert from the age 10 years on. So what means a regular screening? The recommendation is twice a, twice a year. And if you have an oral lesion, then every three months is a general recommendation for checkup. The HPV vaccination was already uh, covered by the lecture of David Cutler. And I would like to add a generally healthy lifestyle is important. So take a look at your diet. What do you eat? The physical activity, so very easy not to exercise, but how many steps do you walk per day? So maybe you can increase that. So an additional also not only um, the diet, also the body weight is important. Uh, don't, uh, so avoid overweight. So uh, there are a lot of data that overweight leads to chronic inflammation in the body and misleading um, of the immune system. So this is something to uh, take care of. And you have heard about mental health and resilience. So how you cope with all these things. It is important to know that you are not alone, that there are experts all over the world to help you and to offer support. And that's really something nice to have in the Fanconi field because we are really good connected. And this is an example of a German Fanconi patient. So you see um, he has a replacement uh, of the lower jaw and he is blind due to his bone marrow transplantation, but still he is a big fighter. Uh, and at that time, uh, when the picture was taken, and he was one month after surgery, and you really can see uh, still the feeding tube that he had, but he again was in the gym exercising, and he is still alive, he's very uh, well doing. And this is amazing how good he can, how was able to fight against the cancer. And he is in a nice example of when you are not uh, afraid, but you take action, how, how good and how possible survival will be even when you have an advanced um, cancer stage. 
I would like to show you an example, and you have seen these pictures before, how early detection can prevent cancer mortality. So this was a lesion um, that we detected in June 2016. One year later, this lesion started to change, to grow. And again, one year later, this was a huge area and the brush biopsy came back positive for cancer cells. And there was only a little tiny cancer sitting in the middle of that lesion, a one millimeter carcinoma in situ. And you can see this was a, is a large lesion. So the diameter was 2.3 millimeters and 1.8 uh, centimeters. So a, a large lesion, but the surgery afterwards, look at that very nice result. So a very good, um, um, uh, also um, 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 very good uh, surgical uh, follow-up after that. You cannot imagine that this is the same, uh, same tongue. So early surgery uh, also prevents you from large, large surgeries. And of course, when this is controlled, you are on the safe side. So we have heard about what we can do against the cancer is the information you have. FAF is very supportive on that. Uh, you have um, um, a, a good um, uh, surveillance, uh, not only for your physician, but also for yourself. You can do inspection and documentation by your own. You will need, need to avoid things, but you can also do things actively against cancer. And with this last slide, I would like to summarize and give you the information where to download this uh, mouth map and also um, the uh, pictures uh, of how to do that uh, inspection and the supportive beneficials. And I would like also um, to um, say that uh, FAF um, uh, and uh, we are in the process of uh, making a professional video of self-examination and brush biopsy in, uh, for physicians so that in the future you will not only have these papers in hand but also some digital uh, help so to perform uh, the oral self-inspection and also some in information for your physician that might help you. So um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you Dr. Fuleifa very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, we don't have any questions yet from our viewers. Oh, somebody raised their hand. Yay, okay. So Rena has a question. Hello. Hi, Rena. Hi, um, I have a question regarding my daughter. Um, she is 14 and she, you know, we see the dentist, let's say two to three times a year in our, mm -hmm. in our annual visit in Minnesota for the endoscope um, and everything's fine. I noticed between my son and her, they have very different mouths. My son has extra saliva, he has no cavities and my daughter probably has a typical mouth, maybe a little on the dry side. But so she's had many cavities in her, chill, in her, in her baby teeth. Um, but so she's 14 and recently she, I guess she had a little chip on one of the back teeth and I didn't realize it. So in the meantime, she had a little bit of a hole and it could have gone on a month. In the, in the meantime, we got to the dentist and he said, oh yeah, we need to do, I don't know what it was called, but, but basically we need to fill that. And he did an x-ray. And again, I'm one of those parents who tries to avoid x-rays unless absolutely necessary. And I didn't really understand truly how many you should do to, to know that something might be going on. And, and I really didn't do much of it. And so he did an x-ray and said, okay, she's at, at risk for mouth, you know, mouth decay or, or tooth decay. So you really, we're going to put this, we're going to seal it, but you need to be really careful. So at this stage, I'm like, gosh, you know, you know, maybe I should have done more x-rays early on. Um, it's just hard to know. And at this point, I feel like they sealed up where that little hole was. And then it concerns me that was there anything in that hole? And going forward, I just don't know how to look at her, her situation. I don't know. What, what do you have to say about any of that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that is a, a very good point that you point out. So uh, luckily, um, most of the x-rays the dentist in our days do um, uh, uh, dose reduced. So um, in, uh, in former days, there have been, because I use a digital, um, uh, digital um, 
uh, camera and uh, um, and so like I would not be too nervous about uh, these dental x-rays and they can also do a pinpoint x-ray so only on the um, on the tooth of uh, indication and not the whole uh, uh, mouth so that is something what you can ask your dentist to do um, and Generally speaking, a good oral hygiene, there are these patients, so I'm not a dentist, I'm a, a, a pediatric hemato-oncologist, but uh, when I see to the experience that we had, um, uh, like Fanconi patients seem to, to tend to have dry mouths. And of course, the, this is a, um, makes them prone to get the cavities. But uh, when you uh, take a good care of those cavities, uh, it is uh, you are in good hand and uh, it is more like when you have these ongoing infections also the gingivitis so like when the cavities are more going to be a, a, a bigger problem than only on the teeth so that's uh, the general recommendation thank you thank you and thank you for the question Okay, we've had a few more questions come in. So the first one is, when can we expect a brush biopsy kit to be available um, for our dentist? And will they be distributed worldwide? And, or can one be obtained at this time to take them to the dentist themselves? So excellent questions. Mm -hmm. um, um, so in Germany, uh, the brush bi uh, biopsy technology is uh, available and is also um, paid by the health insurance. Theoretically, the brush biopsy te technology is available worldwide because, to tell you the truth, we stole the brush from the gynecological uh, people and also um, the storage uh, medium. So, um, generally speaking, this technology is available in the whole world. But we need the lab to do uh, the, um, uh, the analysis and uh, we need to find distribution ways. So that's uh, where we work on in the future. And the brush is very nice, but it's not the, the, the one and only. So it's the whole package. It's the whole, it is, you can only brush what you see. And that's the big disadvantage of the brush. I like the brush very much because you can point out and catch out the lesion to take a biopsy. But uh, yes, we will work on that this technology will become worldwide um, uh, available and um, uh, FAF is very supportive uh, and we will be in the process of finding distribution ways uh, for the states and to prepare kits for the physicians. For the time being, I would like to keep uh, the brushing in the hands of the physicians. We tried uh, with a par parent last week, uh, the brushing and uh, the, the parent was uh, a physician by, by himself and it took us uh, half an hour to take one sample. So even though it seems to be an easy technology and it is easy, you also want, don't want to uh, do the wrong brushing and to feel uh, false safe. So that's uh, the, the back and forth. So we need the whole package. We need training and training of the physicians, training of the lab, and then we are ready to go. Thank you. And we have a kind of a follow-up question to that is where can the analysis be sent? Where are they done now? Are they only done in Germany? So actually the analysis that we do is a cytological analysis and there are uh, labs in every country that do cytological analysis. And now we are in the process of uh, finding labs uh, for each country to be recommended and also labs who are willing to share their uh, samples with us. So the advantage of these samples is that they can be shipped between different uh, uh, labs as well. So uh, without the loss of quality so that you can always can get a second opinion from, uh, from our lab, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a two part question from Marcos who says that there seems um, that special UV lights for oral screening, either infrared or UV lights, are these special lights really useful? And then in addition, could the use of special lights, could they be harmful in the long run? So for Fanconi anemia, no one has um, checked if they, these lights are harmful. Um, theoret theoretically, I don't think so these lights are useful for the untrained eyes to catch lesions. Um, but um, 
it is also so i'm as i said i'm not a dentist i'm not an oral surgeon i'm only pediatric hematologist. oncologist and um, uh, it uh, when you start to look in the mouth and when you start to look carefully you will easily see what you have what you have to see these lights might help but they also sometimes confuse you because they also point out uh, where you have infections and, and something like that. So they can, there is an advantage, but I would use these lights also only with a physician, not all by yourself. Oops. I don't hear you. unmute myself. <laughs> okay, would you recommend, uh, this is from Lisa, would you recommend that they're teeny 13 in self-examining? Or is it better that they did it for him? And how often is it practical? He's seeing the ENT every six months and is pre-transplant. A uh, very important question. Um, actually, I think it depends on the child. So I think we have not to uh, overwhelm our, uh, our patients, our children, with uh, uh, too much of information and the uh, uh, too big burden so I think it's uh, more of a dialogue between your child and you so you can um, offer the information you can discuss do you want to do it um, do uh, do you want to um, uh, do you want to uh, do the inspection by yourself do I have to do the inspection and so on so I, I think there are some patients who would like to do it uh, more by themselves but I mean, like if the mother is checking the mouth once a month, this is enough. The age of 13 is not to be too much of a nervous about when you're not transplanted. Um, we know that there are some few patients between the age of 10 and 20 who develop cancer. All of those patients have been transplanted and uh, had a difficult transplant. So uh, the untransplanted Fanconi patient, they seem to develop these cancers later on. Thank you. Our next question is from Lynn asking if you can discuss your recent publication and the fact that 63% of the worrisome lesions found through the brush biopsies were detected at a pre-malignant stage or stage one when they could be successfully removed. Thank you, Lynn, for um, uh, this additional information. Yes, this is a uh, very important information and also shows the big advantage of a good surveillance. So uh, I've shown you the data, the historical data, uh, where cancers have been diagnosed at late stages. And uh, I would like that we, all of us, think about these things in um, the whole context of, it's not only the brush that was able to catch these early stages, but of course it was the whole setting. It was the information, it was the looking in the mouth, and it was, never the uh, don't judge the lesion that you saw so when when you go to an experienced ENT what they do is they search for cancer to cut out and what is the big advantage of the brush is you just brush everything what you see and by doing that you find early stages and that's uh, 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 that is what we call really early detection and yes we have uh, seen 63% uh, uh, of uh, early stages and stage one, and the surviving of those patients is enormous. So the longest follow-up that we have is longer than 12 years now. So, and this is uh, an enormous uh, and a very good information. So it doesn't mean that when you have these cancers one, that it, once that you are, that the rest of your life is gone. So when you are at early stage and when you are detected these cancers early, then you are on the safe side. And then cancer can be cured and controlled. Thank you. We need to hear that. It's very hopeful and helpful. The next question is about um, if FA patients tend to have dry mouths, is there a recommendation for any mouth rinse to, uh, and what products would be used or any other products besides a mouth rinse to help the dry mouth? Yeah, I mean like uh, what you can do is you can choose chewing gums uh, to uh, enable to produce a mucos. You can drink uh, um, uh, oral rinses. I would be uh, very cautious because most of the oral rinses uh, contain alcohol. So um, keep your mouth uh, wet is always good by drinking. 
and uh, by uh, not eating too much of sugar because this uh, uh, also gives growth advantage to bacteria that um, are not beneficial. So uh, this is more the general recommendation uh, and I don't have a special um, uh, product to, to recommend uh, on that side. Okay, my guess is that some of our listeners um, attendees do and maybe they could share those on the Slack channel. So if any of you have a good oral rinse or and toothpaste, I think as well that you would recommend, you can share that on the Slack channel. Um, another question about uh, x-rays and braces. So can you speak to uh, how often somebody should be x-rayed? Maybe you did that a little bit earlier, but, um, and also braces what to watch out for and so we have seen um, uh, both uh, we have seen very bad mouths with fixed braces so when a patient developed the severe infections and reaction to the fixed braces and we also have seen uh, patients where the fixed braces really had a huge benefit so generally speaking when uh, the, the child has uh, really bad, uh, bad tooth uh, teeth that stay uh, at the very wrong directions, they can cause damage and chronic da damage uh, at the tissue. So, and you don't want to have that. So you need to discuss with your uh, dentist, what is the best way to do? And maybe you try um, a fixed brace and you see how the mucosa is reacting on that. But as soon as you see that there are chronic um, uh, um, uh, lesions uh, or inflammation get rid of them because cr chronic damage, chronic lesion you don't want to have. And in terms of the x-rays, I mean like you really have to think about each x-ray that you do perform, but uh, um, uh, we know that Fanconi patients also receive radiation therapy for oral cancer and these dosages are a lot high, higher uh, than an x-ray. So it is not when you have done one x-ray that uh, this increases your um, uh, chance for getting cancer. There you have different if issues on that and different, uh, um, 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 different uh, uh, um, yeah, factors that contribute to cancer more. Uh, so when your dentist really thinks that you have to do that, you should do that, yeah. Okay, and um, along those lines, is there any foods that would be um, advantageous to stay away from, like hot sauces or any foods that would disrupt the oral mucosa? I um, mean, this is a very um, uh, delicate question because I don't know any study on that. So there are studies about hot drinks for esophageal cancer. So uh, when you drink too hot uh, uh, products, they can really can do tissue damage. So um, uh, I would like uh, uh, more to uh, advertise everything what your child likes, uh, you can go along with because mostly when you do damage to yourself, you get pain, uh, uh, this causes pain. And when you have pain is an alarming signal. And when uh, you, uh, your child feels the pain, then you should stay away from that. So when you drink too hot coffee, too hot tea, that you feel the pain and this is for sure not, uh, not beneficial. So, but uh, in terms of, we also know that uh, the chili, for example, has some uh, antimicrobial um, uh, effect. So, uh, and I don't know if this is uh, uh, like a, a pro and con. So they are, uh, from my uh, point of view, there is no, no, no study uh, or to my knowledge, uh, no study to, uh, on that, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, do you have anything to say about the roof of the mouth having a cobblestone look to it or affect to it? Um, this person has been told that her kids have a mild case, but otherwise nice mouths. So a cobblestoning kind of a bumpy appearance to the roof of the mouth, the palate. Yeah, this is something what we see very frequent in FA. So um, uh, um, it is more like uh, something to document. So, uh, and uh, it is um, um, sometimes also what we see at the tongue that uh, 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 what people call landscape tongue that uh, some people have that. 
So this is something not like an anomaly. This is uh, uh, just something to have uh, as soon as there is, uh, as long there is no change. That's uh, your personal attitude, like uh, the color of your eyes. So there is no um, uh, no association with, uh, to any uh, increased risk. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, apparently, there's been a question in Slack answered whether having a cleft palate surgery increases your oral cancer risk. So, um, uh, I don't know the data on that, but uh, I don't think so. So, when we talk about uh, um, the esophagus, so uh, some of the patients, um, uh, Franconi patients, have been diagnosed with uh, esophageal fistules. And um, it is more important to uh, um, uh, repair those defects because these defects um, are more uh, uh, like problems uh, causing than uh, uh, the surgical re um, uh, repair. Okay, and then lastly, can you speak to the importance of tissue donation if somebody is diagnosed with a cancer or maybe going to have a biopsy what they can do to help advance research with that this is a question of huge importance and i'm very happy uh, that this is been raised so um uh, in fanconi anemia we very often hear um the um um, we cannot judge on that, uh, these or that drug. Uh, we don't have enough uh, sample size uh, to make a, a clear answer. So our team uh, has proven that this uh, is not true for, uh, for Fanconi because we are connected. We have been able to see more than 1,000 Fanconi patients. We have been able to take a lot of brush samples. So, and we have uh, been proven that we have statistically highly significant results. So I would like to encourage each Franconi patient to get in touch with FAF or the local patient support group in terms of when um, they are uh, diagnosed with oral cancer because this tissue is highly needed to do um, uh, uh, screening on and uh, um, also uh, research on to find out uh, what is the uh, what will be the future therapeutic uh, um, uh, products to offer that are not the typical chemotherapies. Uh, and there are many, many new promising drugs, but we need more information because in the past we thought that the Fanconi cancers are comparable to the general population. And it seems now with the more advanced technologies that they differ. And to prove that we need sample, 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 samples. And I very much like um, the uh, uh, idea and, and what FAF is doing that we have uh, dedicated labs where all the samples are sent to so that we have an enormous amount of and a uh, large sample size so that we can answer those questions. And when we work together, this is absolutely feasible. So contact the local patient support group and then we can uh, work out how to process these samples. Thank you. Uh, we have a hand raised by Johanna and we'll let her ask her question. This might be one that needs interpreting, so there might be a little bit of a lag time. Eh, hola. 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 Eh, hablaría en español. Hablo en español. Bueno, mi pregunta es la siguiente. Um, a mi hija hace unos meses atrás Ocho. tuvo eh, unos problemas respiratorios y lo llevamos con el neumólogo. Y le mandó... Yes, I can hear. Le mandó un inhalador que es de formoterol con budesonida de 25 microgramos. El, al... al Eh, al, al iniciar su tratamiento no tuvo ningún problema, pero ya al tener dos o tres meses con el tratamiento, a ella le empezaron a salir unas llaguitas en la boca. El neumólogo me dijo que era relativamente normal por el medicamento, pero cuando ella lo suspende, se le quita y, lo, y cuando lo vuelve a, a usar el medicamento, 
le vuelven a salir esas llaguitas, aunque ella hace enjuagues bucales con bicarbonato de sodio. Okay, we should get a translation of that pretty quickly in our chat box. So if you'll just hold on for a moment. Yeah, I, 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 I understand the English, so I could answer. Or... You understand Spanish? No, I mean like I hear the English translation. Oh, you hear it? Yeah. Okay. So I can, can answer. Wonderful. So I, I, I recall I, I, or I summarize. So um, the patient received due to uh, some lung issues uh, inhalator. And then when she tried uh, the inhalator, she had uh, lesions in the mouth. And without the, um, um, uh, when she stopped the medication, the lesions gone. And when she again used the inhalator, then the lesions came back again. So uh, I assume uh, that this was, uh, have been steroids uh, that she used, and this is very common um, that we see very frequently. So what she can do is when she uses the inhalator, she can rinse the mouth by just drinking a sip of water like I do now, and then uh, rinse the mouth so that the steroids do not stay uh, on the tissue so that um, uh, um, uh, uh, they get cleared off. She should try that. Mostly this works. Um, sorry, no, no me, el intérprete no me tradujo. Sorry. Sí, claro, muy bien. Ya. Yeah. Yo te escucho. Yes, I can repeat. So um, uh, probably this have been steroids uh, that she used. So she should, uh, after the, the, the use of the steroids, uh, the inhalation, she should drink uh, uh, some sip of water or rinse the mouth to get rid of the steroids that stay in the uh, oral cavity and not gone through the lungs. And that should get rid of the problem. Okay. Sí, es lo que hemos estado haciendo, pero a veces en, le salen las llaguitas y a veces no. Aunque ella siempre hace sus enjuagues bucales después de hacer las inhalaciones. That is very important. So, I mean, like, this is very common because it shows uh, how a local immune suppression uh, of... Um, yeah, in the oral cavity can lead to problems. But again, everything that comes and goes after three weeks, you don't need to be afraid of. Okay, si ella le dura unos tres, cuatro días, se le quita. Yeah, perfect. Then don't worry too much. Oh, okay. muchas gracias, muy amable. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for that. And thank you for the interpreters. We really appreciate you very much. Um, okay, Dr. Falefa, I think, oh, we have another hand. Nope. I think that's it for questions. Unless we'll just give it a few seconds, unless you have some closing remarks at all. I'm very happy, uh, I must say, uh, um, seeing the progress that have been done in the last 20 years gives me really hope for the future. Uh, and uh, also to show uh, that we are able to diagnose these cancers early enough really makes me very, very uh, proactive for the future. And I would not like the idea that people are too afraid of these cancers. Thank you. Those are good parting words. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the thank great you. information.